Welcome back to Catholic Courses. I'm Father Kirby and we're continuing our course on the spiritual life. We've taken as the basis of our course, Luke chapter 11, verse one, where the apostles ask Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. The first part, Lord, the second part, teach us, this third part, to pray. Our first part, we address discipleship. In our second part, we address virtue. And then our third part here, we're addressing prayer. For the third part, we've also taken the question from the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 18, what do you want me to do for you? This question was first said to the blind man outside of Jericho right before the Lord healed him. The Lord asked us that same question, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man's response to Jesus was, Lord, I want to see. Had the Lord healed him and said, your faith has healed you. In the same way, we approach the Lord when he asks, what do you want me to do for you? And we also say, Lord, heal our blindness. Help us to see you. Help us to desire to be with you. Help us to have communion with you. Let our faith heal us. And so we have this question as the question for our third part. What do you want me to do for you? And for this particular lecture, I want us to take us to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where Paul says to the Christians, pray without ceasing. Now, how are we supposed to do that? Someone could say practically, well, I have a family, I have a job, I have things I have to be doing all the time. How am I possibly supposed to be praying without ceasing? And of course, we know that the apostle does not mean that we have to be in prayer, actual formal prayer throughout the entire day. Of course, many of us, we have responsibilities according to our state in life. But the apostle is talking about a spiritual awareness and presence so that we can be in a presence, a state of prayer, without ceasing as Christian believers. We're going to talk a little bit about that in our lecture today. First, I want to tell a story. Uh, some years ago, I was sent to an institute to study interreligious dialogue. And as a part of the studies of this institute, we studied all the principal religions of the world. And at the end of each of our module, where we talked about their doctrine, their beliefs, we would go and participate or observe the worship of this particular community. So it was, of course, different forms of Christianity, uh, Islam, Jewish, the Jewish uh, worship and, and beliefs, and of course, Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on. And I remember the visit to the Buddhist temple in particular because, of course, I arrived, I was dressed in my Roman collar as a member of this group, and as we walked into this Buddhist temple, there was an American woman with a Bible, a large Bible in her hand, and she saw me, and she immediately came directly to me, and I was thinking, I have no idea what this is going to be about. Uh, I can wonder this American woman with a large Bible in a Buddhist temple, uh, where, this, where is this going to go? And as she approached me, she said, uh, are, you, are you a Christian minister? I said, yes, I'm a Catholic priest. And, and she said, do you know why I'm here? I have no idea why you're here. Um, she said, well, I'm here because I wanted to learn how to pray. And I went to my local church and I asked them to teach me how to pray. And no one could teach me how to pray. No person, there were nothing, there was no programs, there was nothing to teach me how to pray. Now, that woman's desire is the desire of every person. And her experience, there was nothing to help her, no guidance, is one of the reasons why we have this course. One of the reasons why, in the course of our lectures, we have attempted to present all kinds of wealth from the church's treasury, the spirit, church's spiritual patrimony, ways and means and methods for us to grow in the spiritual life. But that question, no one taught me how to pray, that's a question we ask. It's a question that has inspired these lectures. We have to wonder ourselves, do we know how to pray? The church has taught us how to pray. We have the resources to help us to learn how to pray. But sometimes people say, but Father, I just don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. And one of the first things I say to someone when they actually approach and ask to learn how to pray is I ask the person, do you know how to complain? <laughs> if a person knows how to complain, then a person knows how to pray. <laughs> In fact, some of the best prayers of the scriptures are holy people complaining to God. Now, it's not our most mature or best type of prayer, but that can be a great beginning. So to this woman in this Buddhist temple, it's like, if you want to learn how to pray, we can teach you how to pray. For us, as we want to learn how to pray, 
we can just begin by opening our heart and sharing with the Lord all the things that are causing us trouble. We can just complain, just open our hearts. So that's when I tell people that, like, yeah, well, you know, this is happening and my kids are involved in this and, and problems with my spouse and I don't know where my work is going and they have all these problems and, and so on. And I said, well, just open up your heart and complain to God. Tell him what's going on. And I, well, I, 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 I couldn't do that. I, I couldn't tell God that. <laughs> Sometimes I laugh. I was like, you know what? Look, God's big. He can take it. <laughs> right? Just tell God what's on your heart because what we don't need what our relationship with God does not need are pious people who are telling God what they think God wants to hear. God knows all things, but he wants his children to share those things with him. So if there's a lot of suffering, if we have questions, if we are upset, we need to speak to God from the depths of our heart. We need to explain to him exactly what's going on. That's the first part, is just opening up our heart and maybe that might take the form of complaining. And that can be, again, a good start. Now, obviously, after that, we want to begin to develop that. As I sometimes say, imagine the conversation you have with your best friend or close friend. And you take that conversation and you just move it to your prayer. And you have that exact conversation with God. Now we're growing. Now our prayer life, our conversation with God, is getting much deeper. And then eventually... You leave pauses in the conversation so that God can talk back. So we can develop a spirit of silence, a spirit of listening, so that we can hear God speak to us. These are some of the ways in which we can just begin to talk with God. Because sometimes people do say, well, I want to set this time for prayer. I want to have that five minutes of prayer in the morning to to begin this habit. I just don't know what to do. And those can be some options. One other option I want to suggest if a person is in the right place spiritually, gratitude. Gratitude. Just open up your heart and begin your prayer with everything that you want to say to God. Just tell Him all that is there, all the things that you're grateful for, all the things that you have appreciation to Him for bestowing upon yourself or loved ones. Just share acts of gratitude. What I do want to stress as we develop a life of prayer, this conversation with God, is one thing we have to be cautious of. It's a good thing, but we want to be cautious, is that our prayer is not simply a list of petitions. These are all the things that I want you to do for me, God. (laughs) There it is. That's it. That's our entire prayer. And this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Petition can be a very important part of prayer, but we have to be cautious that it's not our only prayer. Because there are many people that will approach a life of prayer as if it is simply that. God is the divine handyman that we go to to come and to maintain or to fix our problems. That's it. That's it. That's what prayer is. I tell God what I want, and he gives it to me. If he doesn't give it to me, well, I'm not going to believe in him anymore. And it becomes this kind of quid pro quo, which is not prayer and certainly does not reflect a relationship with God. Because that is what prayer is supposed to be, a relationship with God. I desire to pray. I want to be with God. So oftentimes, people can think, well, if God really loves me, and if God really wants me to believe in him, then this is what I want. We're almost bargaining with God. You want me to believe in you, God? Then you better give this to me. And we have to, we have to really temper that and mature that in our spiritual lives so we can approach God with prayer, in prayer as a relationship. I want to be with God. We also have to be careful in our relationship with God that we don't think we have to convince God to do good things. This is a very important point in Christian prayer. If we approach God and think, well, if I just say enough prayers, or if I get enough people to pray, if we just storm heaven, you know, then we're going to force God or make God or convince God to do something good for us. You have to be careful of that. That's actually pagan prayer. The gods, they don't really care about us. They always want to do mischievous things to us. But if we really beg hard enough, or if we get enough people, then God will do something good for us. We have to be careful. The Lord tells us, who among you, what parent would give a child a scorpion when they ask for bread, or give them a serpent when they ask for an egg? And Jesus says, and if you who are wicked can do good things for those that you love, how much more your Father in heaven? We have to realize when we approach God, God is already the one 
who desperately and greatly wants to do good things for us. We don't have to convince God. When we pray, we're changing more ourselves than we're changing God. And that is the conversion that happens when prayer is allowed to be a relationship and not just a grocery list. Lord, this is what you're going to do for me. So we have to deepen in our prayer. That will take time to develop. That's not going to happen the first time we really start praying. We're going to have to allow some conversion. That leads us to the purgative way because that is some of the aspects that it will be addressed and purified in the purgative way. So we need to approach that. As we begin to grow, we begin to develop both more and deeper life of prayer. God begins to speak to us and take us in different directions where we need to go. There are also specific prayer methods given to us by the church. So we can have a Lectio Divina, where this just means sacred page, where we take a part of the scriptures, particularly the scriptures because they're the inspired word of God. We might just take a part and sit with it. Lord, teach us to pray. And I just sit and I meditate on that. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. And I allow God to enter into the silence and calm that I create by this particular prayer form. Then we have a prayer form called Pustinia, which is where we take all images out of our mind. We simply decide to clear our minds as best we can. No images, no petitions, nothing. And we sit in a posture of radical receptivity. And we ask God to give us a word. That's another prayer form. We also have composition of place. Now this is the exact opposite of Pustinia. Composition of place is when we take a scene from the scriptures and we develop it with our spiritual imagination. So it's the wedding feast of Cana and we see the dancing at the wedding and we hear the music and we have the stewards walking around with with the wine and we have we just develop this whole scene in our imagination and then we enter into a colloquy a conversation with Jesus in the midst of this scene these are just three of many prayer forms that are given by the church and they help us as we develop a life of prayer to stabilize to set our prayer so that we can talk to God and we can listen to him And eventually we would say, what is the best prayer form? The one that helps you encounter God. What is the best prayer form? The one that most helps you enter into that deeper relationship with God. Our prayer forms, they will change. They will change. They will change with with our age. They will change with circumstances in life. They will change with our moods. And we should understand that. So we can never let ourselves get set. No, no, I'm going to do composition of place. Look, if you're tired and and you're just not there with your cognitive powers, then you eventually just move and you just do something else. Maybe a Pustinia, maybe a Lexio Divina. Remember, the prayer forms of the church are meant to help us encounter God. And sometimes, especially in the purgative way, and sometimes in the illuminative way, there might just be quiet times when really prayer forms, even that spontaneous prayer of dialogue, conversation with Christ, is just extremely difficult. And that's where the church helps us. The church gives us set prayers. Even the great saints, the doctors of mystical prayer, have told us that there were times in their spiritual lives when it was just spiritual reading, so the reading of of a good spiritual book, or it was just set prayers. Maybe the rosary, maybe the angelus, maybe some other set form, prayer form according to their culture. So we need to understand that as well, that the set prayers of our church have a very important part to play, and we should understand them as best we can. We can, in a sense, see them as both a help to our spontaneous prayer and a safety net if we get tired or we just are not able for some reason to have that kind of spontaneous prayer. That's ideal, but sometimes our spirit or the Holy Spirit is, we're just not able to do that. We need to understand that and be patient with ourselves in those times. No, no, no. I have to pray. I have to pray. It's like, chill out. Okay. We can't force what God's not willing to give us. And sometimes God's grace says, relax, relax. So we have to understand that. With all this said, I want to say it is very important that as a Christian grows in the spiritual life, that that Christian has a spiritual director. As I'm giving you general counsel, and I stress this is general counsel, 
It will be a spiritual director, a priest, a deacon, or a member of the lay faithful who's been trained and is seasoned in the ways of God. And that's to your discernment what person you would want to ask to do this. It's good for you to approach that spiritual director and to disclose where you are in your spiritual life because that director can give you particular counsel based on where you are. So in one sense, I'm like the traffic light or the traffic signs right now. I'm giving you general counsel. But when you get a spiritual director, it's like the police officer that's standing there. And as we know in driving, if there's a police officer and there's a sign, you follow the police officer. In the same way, when you have a spiritual director, you need to follow his counsel or her counsel in where she directs you or he directs you. So a spiritual director is very important. What is spiritual direction? I want to draw a distinction between three activities in the church. First, obviously, is confession. Secondly, is spiritual direction. Third, is pastoral counseling. So confession is something unique. Sometimes a spiritual director is not our confessor. Obviously, if they're not a priest, but sometimes even when our spiritual director is a priest, we may want to have someone else as our confessor, the priest we go to confession to. So confession is distinct. Sometimes they're brought together, but they're distinct because confession is the confession of sins, the healing by God's grace, the absolution of sin. That's it. That is the specific and very strict forum of the sacrament of confession. Then we have spiritual direction, which is what we call the internal forum. So that is our life of prayer, our relationship with God, our life of virtue, all these are aspects. It is very important that we do not confuse spiritual direction with pastoral counseling. What is pastoral counseling? Pastoral counseling is when I go to a priest or someone seasoned in the ways of God and I'm just struggling with something. Maybe it's my relationship with my brother. Maybe it's my relationship with my local parish priest. Maybe it's the maturity of my own emotions. Maybe it's all the above. And I just need to talk to someone who knows the ways of God, who can help me to introduce my faith into the situation that I'm struggling with. Now, it is acceptable that if I go to my spiritual director and we do spiritual direction, And then afterwards, we engage in pastoral counseling. That's okay. But we just have to realize the difference, spiritual direction and pastoral counseling. And we have to be very cautious that these two do not blur because it could eventually happen where our spiritual direction sessions are really just opportunities to vent and for pastoral counseling. So one can meet with a spiritual director for an entire hour and never even address the person's life of prayer or virtue. All they've talked about is family problems, work problems, emotional problems, everything. We have to be very careful with that. Not because neither of either of these are, are bad, but just to be and to have integrity in what we're doing. So with that said, what is spiritual direction? Spiritual direction is when I go to someone who is skilled in the ways of God, a priest, deacon, a religious sister, perhaps someone of the lay faithful who's trained and, and seasoned in God, and I disclose where I am with God. And that spiritual director serves as an agent of the Holy Spirit to help me discern God's will. So the spiritual masters will use the example of St. Paul. Paul is brought to Damascus. He is in the basement of the house of Judas. He's broken, he's blind, he's confused. He doesn't know what happens. What is hap- what happened, what is happening, he, he, he's confused. And what does God do? God wakes up Ananias, a disciple, and says, Ananias, get up. So, yes, Lord. I want you to go down Straight Street to the house of Judas. There in the basement, you will find Paul of Tarsus, and I want you to go to him. <laughs> and Ananias says, um, whatever you want, Lord, but you do know that's the guy that's killing us, right? Just, just want to make sure. And, of course, God says, yes, go. And imagine Ananias probably thought that it was a call to martyrdom. Because this Paul was killing Christians. But he was obedient. He got ready. He went down straight street to the house of Judas there in the basement. Imagine his shock. When he walked in, he saw Paul of Tarsus, the great persecutor, broken and blind. And then Ananias preached the gospel to him. Paul converted. Ananias baptized him. The church has always used the figure of Ananias as the example of what a spiritual director should be. 
Our spiritual director comes to us, preaches the gospel to us, helps us to experience God's grace, to experience God's healing. And our spiritual director assists us. So we have to understand that. When we go to see our spiritual director, we should prepare for that. We should pray for what we want to talk about. We should pray for our spiritual director. Lord, grant him, grant her the grace to assist me. We should have an idea of what we want to talk about. We spoke earlier about a rule of life. We should have that ready so that when we go to see our spiritual director, we can address these aspects with him. So we can say, well, here are my spiritual exercises. Okay, I've been at 80% on this, you know, or 60% or whatever it might be, you know. Or maybe there's a certain area you want to address. Maybe we want to adjust our spiritual exercises, increase them or deepen them, or maybe lighten up on them if you find out this is just too hard right now. And our reform of life, our particular examine, to talk about our life of virtue. The rule of life should be one of our agenda items, and I would say our principal agenda item, when we meet with our spiritual director. Very, very important. Now, with that said in regards to spiritual direction, I want to talk a little bit about the rule of life. We've already explored and developed the rule of life in its fullness. I want to mention just a few more aspects in regards to our spiritual exercises. So you remember the rule of life has our particular examine, the reform of life, and our spiritual exercises. I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk specifically about the morning offering. This is a small little prayer that is so oftentimes dismissed or given no attention. But I think it's one of the best prayers we can offer as Christian believers every morning. Now, there's a set form to this prayer, but you can pray however you want with these same sentiments. I know for myself, I cannot imagine getting out of bed without saying this. Oh my Jesus, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I offer you all my prayers, works, joys and sufferings of this day, in union with the holy sacrifice of the Mass throughout the world, in reparation for sin, for all the intentions of my friends and associates, and for the general intention recommended this month by the Holy Father. Now that's the way I pray. That's one of the set versions of this prayer. You can pray it however you need to. The point of the morning offering is from the very beginning. We say, Lord, I have no idea what this day is going to include, but I give it all to you. My joys and sufferings, the triumphs, the difficulties, I'm giving you everything. And I think the morning offering can be a very important part of our rule of life for our spiritual exercises. Also, I want to talk again just briefly about the importance of sanctifying our day's activities. In the morning especially, if we know this is going to be a really hard conversation, or this is going to be a very difficult decision I have to make today, or, man, I really just don't enjoy this, or, man, I'm just not feeling well, and I've got all these meetings and everything going on today, and so on, that from the very beginning, we can just give all those to the Lord. Lord, bless that meeting I'm going to have with Sally. I, her personality just really bothers me. And please let me be attentive and, and, and help. And, and Lord, that meeting, it's going to be long. I, I, I hate budget meetings. Like, Lord, just give me attentiveness and so on. We can right away from the beginning just begin to pray and give our entire day to the Lord. As we look at our day, as we look at our desire to develop a life of prayer, two things we need to be attentive to. Solitude, solidarity. We will need time to just be by ourselves. Remember every evening in his public ministry, the Lord would remove himself from the apostles and pray. According to our state in life, that solitude might be five minutes in the morning. It might be a few minutes at lunch. It might be a couple minutes, in the, whatever it might be. It's going to be different, but we have to make sure that we give ourselves that solitude. Also, solidarity. We can't always be alone. Spouses, Christian spouses, need to pray together. Christian families, it is true. The family that prays together stays together. We also need to develop prayer groups, men's groups, women's groups, young moms groups, whatever. We need to have this solidarity also in our prayer. All of our prayers cannot be by ourselves. We need, and, and not just with the liturgy, of course, but also beyond the liturgy, we need to have other communal expressions of our prayer. We need this solidarity. And with both of those said, I want to talk a little bit about the liturgy of the hours. What a tremendous gift. And most Christians do not realize this. The church prays seven times a day, every three hours, excluding only midnight. 
So every three hours, the church is at prayer. Now, most of our prayer are our monks and, and religious sisters who are in the cloister praying for us. But we also, as members of the baptized, we are called to participate in the liturgy of the hours, especially what are called the hinge hours. That's morning prayer and evening prayer. Now, maybe you're saying, well, what are the liturgy of the hours? I've never heard of this. Liturgy of hours is the praying of the Psalms, principally. It's a prayer of about eight to 12 minutes that's usually prayed, as I mentioned, every three hours. It is a great way to pepper the day with the, God, with the Lord's presence, with God's grace. The church tells us that the liturgy of the hours prolong the effects of or prepare for the celebration of the Eucharist. It helps us in praying the liturgy of the hours to understand how central the Eucharist is to our faith, to our discipleship. So liturgy of the hours is a tremendous way to begin to pray. I've seen great parishes who have begun to pray communally morning prayer and evening prayer because it's the baptized reclaiming the prayer of the entire church. There was a time when basically just priests and religious sisters prayed the liturgy of the hours. That's it. And when we pray it, it's called the divine office because it's a sacred responsibility. I'm obliged under a solemn promise. But it should not just be the prayers of priests and religious sisters. This is the prayer of the entire church. And it's powerful, and I've only seen it a couple times, when Christian families pray morning prayer, most of the time it's evening prayer, together. Powerful. That is the church praying its prayer. The liturgy of the hours can be a great gift, especially as a person begins to develop a prayer life and to work on the rule of life. The liturgy of the hours can be a great help, especially in those dry moments. I love the liturgy of the hours because <laughs> I know whatever happens, I'm going to have my prayer time set. So when there are great times, it's like, yeah, this is great. I just want to talk to God from my heart. That's perfect. But I have the liturgy of the hours. And there are times where it's like, I just, I just can't, I just can't pray. It's just it's dry. I had the liturgy of the hours. That can be a resource to each of us. The Catechism of the Catholic Church speaks about the battle of prayer. It is a battle. It is a battle. People oftentimes say, I don't pray because I don't have any time. If you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. People don't pray for two reasons. They don't believe that prayer makes a difference. They don't believe that prayer will bring about results. They don't believe in prayer. We have to be aware of that. I know a person who recently had to start taking medication for a heart condition. If they don't take the, this medicine, they can cause major problems. They could even die. This person will never, never miss that medication. No matter how busy their day is, they're not going to miss that medication because they know this pill is saving my life. That's the same spirit we need to approach our prayer. Prayer works. Prayer brings about a difference. We believe that, we're going to pray. We see tremendous stories throughout the scriptures of this battle of prayer. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is rich in its description of the battle for prayer. We're weak, we're fallen, we're distracted, but we have to fight for the life of prayer. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the unitive way. We talked a little bit about the purgative way, the illuminative way. I'm not going to say much about the unitive way. I want to mention it, but most spiritual masters agree that the majority of us will not get to the unitive way until heaven. That it is such a difficult stage, a difficult way in the spiritual life, very few people reach it. But I do want to mention it. We spoke about the purgative way, the illuminative way, the unitive way. Unitive way is where now the soul is in quiet contemplation. There really is very little conversation. One simply is in God. And the quiet contemplation eventually leads to contemplative absorption, where a person could be in prayer, hours can go by, and the person has no realization of time. These amazing stories that we hear about so many of our saints. And the conclusion of the unitive way, as we have recently seen the example of Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa, is at the end of the unitive way, God will allow a tremendous purification for the person, but also for the church in allowing the dark night of the senses where the God does not feel, the person does not feel God's presence in any way. It's the dark night of the sense. And then the dark night of the soul, where even the intellect and the will of the person no longer feels or knows 
of the presence of God. These are tremendous sufferings that most of us would never be able to endure. God allows the strong among us who've reached that level to suffer this for our sake because their suffering brings about grace that allows us to get through the purgative way. So this unitive way is a tremendous gift. It's worth mentioning. I don't want to focus much on it because so many of us need help in the purgative and the illuminative way. Well, dear friends, we have covered so much in our course. We've talked about discipleship. We've talked about virtue. We've talked about prayer. There is so much more to say, but we've addressed the highlights, the fundamentals that we need. As we have with the apostles approached the Lord, Lord, teach us to pray. Looking at Lord, teach us and pray. And as we turn to him, the Lord will do to us what he did to the apostles. He will give to us what he gave to them, and he will teach us how to pray. Thank you for being a part of this Catholic Courses. We have so many other great Catholic courses. Learn more. I encourage you to continue in your Christian formation. Thank you for joining us for this course, and God bless you.